Hello ladies and gentlemen, in today's video I am going to be talking about the uh, Fuji 10-24 to lens and why, when they've just released a brand new version of it, I've decided to buy a second-hand model. I'll see you after this. For a video, this is possibly a little bit more sedate than the ones that I usually make. I'm sat in, uh, well, next to uh, Nunny Castle, which is where I was over the weekend. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk in particular about this lens, about the Fujifilm 10-24. Uh, this is the original version of the lens, and um, I've only just got a copy of it. It's um, got your know, optical image stabilization. It's got one of those nice little rings for changing your uh, your aperture, and one of those other nice little rings for, for focusing. One thing I did notice about this, despite the motorbike in the background, one of the things I did notice about this is that it's it's one of those lenses that doesn't move when you change it. So if I if I do that to change the thing, the, it's actually the internal piece that's moving. It's not the uh, it's not the body of the lens, so you, you're not you're not moving in and out like that. The whole thing's stored inside the body of the lens, which is quite nice um, and uh, it, it novel for me. You know, I'm used to having, the, you know, the 100 to 400 where you, you turn it and suddenly you've got a Canon instead of just a lens on on the front of your camera. So why, when the new lens is available and the new lens is better in some respects, have I chosen to get a second-hand lens? which is nonetheless is a good quality lens you know uh, but why did i decide to go with a second hand one as opposed to getting the brand new uh 10 to 24 um and and you know everything that comes along with that well let's start off by talking about the benefits of the new lens first it's new which i suppose is a benefit i i, I guess secondly Okay, look, I don't, there wasn't that much to say about that. But secondly, um, the great big thing that they're charging for, or they're charging extra for with the, uh, with the new version of the lens is uh, weather resistance. Essentially, the, lens, the, the new lens that you've got is exactly the same as this one. The optics are the same, the quality of the thing's the same, uh, the motorbike in the background is the same. Um, but uh, everything else is, you know, the same apart from this, this weather resistance. And for the cost of weather resistance, bear in mind you can't get the old version brand new anymore, you have to get second-hand versions of it. For the cost of that weather resistance, you are paying nearly £900. Which I don't know, that works out at something like $1,300 US. So, you then have to look in terms of, you know, if you're, if you're going to take a completely utilitarian approach to it, the, the weather re resistance is, is useful because your camera might get wet one day. But for the amount of money that you're actually paying to get this weather resistance, are you going to be out in the rain that much? Is it going to be that much of an issue? If you are in a situation where you might be out in the rain, can you just go, well, I won't use that lens today then? And I think you can. So I've scoured the second-hand markets, and for just under £600 sterling, which I'm guessing is probably in the region of about $1,000, um, I've picked up this 10 to 24 and the quality of it is absolutely phenomenal. Right down to the, uh, the box, the, the lens itself, everything that came with it, it's, I, it was like new. And it was described as like new on the box when I bought it. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the, the benefit of me buying this lens is that I've saved myself um, nearly £300, which is, is, is no laughing matter when you consider what that 300 quid that can get you speed lights that can get you uh, another lens if you go for a cheaper lens it can get you you know um but we often see channels especially out here who do gear reviews and stuff and they get the lenses and they have them for free uh maybe not forever but for a period of time they'll get a free copy of the lens that they can play around with and that's great for them um plus you know by the time you've got enough followers enough subscribers uh the chances are you've got some way to being able to buy a new lens when it comes out but for everybody else 
and this is kind of where I want to stay in terms of having a channel for everybody else, the question of price is actually incredibly important. Um, you know, the money that I've saved can go into so many other things. And what I've actually lost from getting a secondhand lens isn't, a mu isn't very much. In fact, largely you can have this conversation about secondhand equipment across the board. Um, a secondhand uh, a camera, for example, camera body. Uh, I mean, many of us will have gone for a secondhand camera body. I, I didn't with this one, but the X-T2 that I use as a studio camera at home is my mum's old camera. Essentially, it's a secondhand camera. And the only difference between that and buying one from somewhere else is that it was owned by somebody who I know, and I know that they've kept it, you know, in good working order and everything. So what do I think about the lens itself? It's phenomenal. Um, I haven't had anything which is quite like this. It's sharp right across the frame. There is, if you really pixel peep on the images, there is a little bit of blurring towards the edges of the lens. But I've said this before. If you're seriously taking photos and worrying about the edges of your lens, then you might not be considering the, the impact of the actual photo itself. A slightly blur blurred edge is not that important on a photo. And, it, and we are talking slightly blurred. We are talking like, you know, really pixel peeping in on something which actually, if your subject is sharp, won't be sharp in the first place. Uh, the lens is an F4, but it's also, uh, it's an F4 right the way through the range, but it's also 10 mil. And, you know, people are going to buy this and they'll want to use it at 10 mil. And they should, it's great. It's a fantastic lens for uh, uh, 10 millimeters. You do get, if you're not used to it, you do get a little bit of kind of fish eyeing as you zoom out between that 24 and that 10 range. But you soon get used to it. And you know, there's, there's no real problem about doing anything, um, anything with it. The applications for a lens like this, obviously we've talked about landscape photography uh, before and, and whether, you know, the, the great thing about this is those landscape photography shots that full frame camera owners get when they say, oh, I've got a 16 mil lens and I've got this big rock in the foreground and then it zooms up and I've got a castle in the background. I've got, you know, this wonderful sky in there. Well, those are taken on 16 mil lenses on full frame cameras. So what's the equivalent on an APS-C? Uh, if you divide by 1.6, it's a 10 mil lens. So in theory, this lens can do that sort of shot. And that was actually the reason why I wanted to pick one up in the first place. But there's other applications if you've got 10 mil uh, at f4 as well. And possibly one of the most important ones is real estate photography. I come here to a castle today, and this is the video that was on Sunday. So hopefully you've already seen that video, or you can click back on the channel and you can see it somewhere else. I've come here today really because I wanted to take a building because taking buildings, especially really tall buildings, is where a lens like this absolutely shines. You get phenomenal results. You don't have to be so far away from your subject that other things are getting in, in, into, your, into your shot. Uh, you know, you're, you're standing, I, I suppose, a couple of hundred yards away from your subject, and you're getting a massive tower at the, at the front of your shot. Uh, and that's quite amazing. Uh, that's a, a really useful thing. Similarly, if you go inside and take a picture of a room, the picture that you're going to get at 18 mil is going to be so, it's going to feel cramped. At 10 mil, it's going to look much better, much more open, much more inviting. And there's a few things that you have to worry about. You have to make sure that you get your verticals straight wherever possible, or straighten them up when you get into something like Photoshop or Lightroom. But beyond that, there's not much. You'd frame up your shots like you'd normally frame up your shots. Some things you're going to get and it's going to look just right. You know, um, the shots that I did in Yorkshire last year, I, I got a picture of, um, not last year, sorry, the year before, where I got a picture of the uh, um, Whitby Abbey, the, the famous Dracula Abbey. That's a shot that arguably I could have done on a uh, 10 mil lens, and I'd have just got the whole thing in, in, in 10 mil. Whereas, uh, because I was on an 18 mil lens at the time, I had to take a series of shots, I had to stitch them all together. So one of the things that this does is it's gonna stop, or you know, at least help prevent all of that stitching together, which is a good thing. It, it takes time out of your, your 
uh, your process. It means that you're not working with incredibly massive files as well. But of course, because of the new super resolution in, in the enhanced thing inside Lightroom and, and Photoshop, it does mean that you still have a pretty big image if you want to print it. The other problem, if I'm talking about that, because I did do a video about this uh, last week about printing images and about megapixels and sizes and super resolution and stuff like that. Uh, one of the things uh, that I did notice was that if you, that Chris Howe did a video and it shows you that if you print a 12 megapixel image at various different sizes and you print a 100 megapixel image at various different sizes, you can't really tell the difference between the two. So you kind of have to ask yourself, you know, is what you're doing a, a real benefit to you and to everything that's going on? Or, uh, you know, are you just clambering for extra megapixels because you keep feeling that you need extra megapixels? Sometimes you don't. That's just a, 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 a thing. Now, I can't not talk about this lens uh, without uh, talking about the kind of the quality of Fuji lenses because they are really, I mean, I, I haven't had a sort of a, a lens system quite like it. Whereas with Sigma, for example, you get lenses, some lenses are just phenomenally good and the other, one, other ones you're going, well, this isn't quite good. The XF lenses from Fuji, I don't think I've seen one that isn't actually good for the thing that they've created it for. And that's quite phenomenal. Um, the, I, the quality of this thing is just r remarkable, which kind of brings me on to the conclusion of today's video. If you're looking for a 10 to 24 lens, because the new ones have come out and because lots of people are jumping on the new ones going, oh, I want the weather resistance, there is a good selection of second-hand 10 to 24 lenses on the market right now. What does that mean? Well, that means that you can pick something like this up for under, under £600. Um, and, you know, and, and it is, like I said, it is like new. It is... There are no marks on it, there were no scratches on it, the, the, the lens is in brilliant condition, the box was in brilliant condition. It is, it's like it's never been used. And if that's the case, why would you buy a new one? Why would you spend all of that extra money on a, on a new lens? You really don't need to. And as many photographers who've got the older version of this lens before and have taken it to incredibly snowy locations or in raining locations or you know, what have you. There are plenty of landscape photographers out there using the Fuji system who've got this exact lens and they love it. With that in mind, would you really buy a brand new version of this lens? I said no, because of the cost. If you've got the money and it's burning a hole in your pocket and you think actually the weather resistance could be useful, go for it because you're not going to get a bad lens because of it. It's, it's a brilliant, absolutely brilliant uh, lineup. Fantastic addition uh, to what you've already got with uh, the rest of the Fuji lenses. I've now got uh, this one, uh, the 18 to 55, the 100 to 400, uh, and I'm looking at the 70 to 300, um, partly because I want to feature it on the channel and partly because I want a lens which kind of works as a wildlife lens, but isn't so heavy to carry around that I have to actually say, okay, well now I'm going out to do some wildlife photography. Um, I think with that, with those lenses in place, and possibly one more, which I'm looking into at the moment, uh, I would have everything I need for every eventuality. And that's kind of where you need to be with your camera. You know, if you get to a point where you go, well, it doesn't matter what shot I need to take, I know exactly which lens I'm gonna pick up. If you can do that, you're in a really good position. And that's where I'm gonna leave today's video. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've got something from it. I hope if you do decide to pick up one of these lenses, you'll consider a second-hand one, as opposed to just going, oh, I'll pay the full amount for something and then realizing that you don't need it. And I hope that you'll join me next time on the next video. Uh, until then, if you have liked what you've seen here, please do leave a comment. Uh, if you would like to hit the little bell icon and click on uh, this subscribe button, in fact, do that in reverse. Click subscribe first, hit the bell icon, choose all notifications, then anytime I put out a new video, you'll get uh, a message to let you know that it's out. Until next time, thanks ever so much for coming along and don't forget, keep taking those photos.